Thank you, Dave. Um, they're all good stories, I can assure you. Um, although having Bruce Lawson feel your hands repeatedly over evening can be a bit disconcerting. Hey, so I'm going to talk about performance. Um, and Lara talked about it a bit, but we all bring biases to what we do. They're built in to who we are. And one thing to remember when I talk about performance is the background I come from. I generally work with commercial clients, with retail clients, with publishers, with telcos. I don't tend to do much work in the non-profit area or in people delivering governmental services or information-based products. So some of the things I talk about, I will relate to them, but you may have to apply some thinking on top. But one of the places I'd like to start is with a clicker that works. Um, it's one of the things we love in performance is we love to talk about proxy metrics. Uh, and what I mean by proxy metrics is what uh, Sophie Alpert of the React team um, describes as proxy metrics. Things like page size, or the number of requests, or the number of scripts, or number of third-party resources. Things that we can easily count on a page. And when we make changes, we can easily count how they, those things have changed. But we often don't know, did they actually make any real difference? So we reduced the amount of JavaScript on the page, but it probably made a difference to our visitors, but are we sure? And that gives us a challenge in that we rely on the simple, easy things to measure. And that often means that we make changes without really understanding whether we're benefiting the people who visit our sites. And, you know, proxy metrics are great for headlines. You know, in 2016, Wired talked about the average size of a web page was larger than doom. Or, in whenever Arnaud talked about it, it's. I can't remember quite when, that might be about 2015, is the average web page is larger than a floppy disk. Does anybody know what a floppy disk is anymore? It's the save icon. Um, <laughs> so they're great for headlines, but they don't really tell us that much. They are useful. They are useful as guardrails. If we keep track of how big our pages are, what our image sizes are, how many third parties we have on a page, over time, what it allows us to do is to detect when things go wrong. It would allow, for example, Black Friday two years ago, I believe it was, marketing campaigns over Black Friday, Cyber Monday, roll out really, really quickly. Uh, one supermarket managed to roll out a 10 megabyte image onto their mobile homepage on a Saturday morning. Nobody noticed because they weren't tracking those proxy metrics. So they do have value. And, you know, as here from the HB archive, we can track them over time. And where I've resized the slide, you can't really see it. But since October 2016 to July 2019, our JavaScript our page has gone up 40%. It keeps on going up, unfortunately, and we'll discuss onto that in a bit. But they don't represent our visitors' experience. How big a page is, how many requests a page make, doesn't represent or often doesn't represent what our visitors will experience. Um, this is a film strip made in WebPageTest. Uh, go to webpagetest.org, type your site in, make sure to create a video box is 
checked, and as well as a, something called a waterfall, you will get a film strip. And when we walk through this film strip, we'll watch it go through. It's for Black's Leisure, um, outdoor shop in the UK. And it goes through, and we can see, start to get a logo, start to get some content, get a product image, and we get some third parties that tell you other people are looking at this product. Well, who cares what other people are looking at? Is it the right sleeping bag for me is what I want to know. But, you know, we looked at it here, and this film strip is 13 and a half seconds. And I have a question for you all. I know it's the afternoon. I know Lara asked you a bunch of questions. You had to do some work then. So what I want you to answer is, do you think this web page is, it's not particularly fast, but do you think it's larger or smaller than a floppy disk? And so I'll ask you the two questions. And unlike some other cases where I ask, is it this or that, there is no trick third answer. It is one or the other, honest. So who thinks the web page is larger than a floppy disk? Oh, oh, my daughter's really not sure over there. <laughs> Who thinks it's smaller than a floppy disk? You are correct. Even though this page takes roughly around somewhere around 10 seconds to deliver the complete experience to the visitor, it is only, I say only, and it makes me cringe a bit, 1.2 megabytes in size. But the size often doesn't relate to the experience we deliver to people. And what we've got used to is, is taking these images, these film strips, and collapsing them down into thinking about what's the experience we're delivering. What are we delivering to somebody? And you know, the questions I do this with clients is I give them a film strip and I, you know, I ask them. Think about this from a visitor's perspective. Think about it from, they have the blank screen. Often we don't have the blank screen. Often what we have is the page we're navigating from still on the screen. And at some point, we get a logo up that tells us something's happening. Uh, when does our page become useful? It's not just in a product's terms. Can I read the news? Can I read when my bins are going to be collected? Can I see the product I might want to buy? And then finally, when can we interact with it? And think about it in these terms. And what I really encourage people to is don't just accept the default. Don't accept the 46,000 CSS classes that Andy talked about when you use defaults. But control the content. Choreograph it so that the things that are most important to your visitors arrive first. And the way I think about it is I split them up. This way, when I'm thinking about how I analyze it for people. And although I've missed off the, the browser frame from, from these images, often the first indication that our visitors get that something's happening comes from the device or the browser. On iOS, you start to get the spinny wheel of network activity at the top. Um, you'll get the, I want to call, it's not status bar, is it? The progress bar um, appearing. And think about that. Think about how long, because this is this, from a blank screen to the logo appearing, is governed basically by two things. One, how long did our server take to render? And I know in the world of performance, we've got into 80 to 90% of the visitor's performance is on the front end, so we start there. The biggest win I had this year is I, one client, we took half a second out of how long it took for their category listing page to load. And it made a, a massive difference because a database on the back end is a shared resource. So if you've got people listing products and each of those queries takes half a second, that means other queries can't run. So not only by fixing um, one 30-line piece of code, 
uh, in an afternoon? Did we make that page half a second faster? Because the other queries were no longer queuing up behind it, everything else on the site got a tenth of a second faster. So although we encourage people to focus on the front end because that's where the wins are, there are plenty of gains to be made on the back end as well. And often, until we get to this point, we can tell at this point, normally, I'll say normally, the browser limit here is how long it takes to download and parse and execute the content that's in the head. Um, you can do freaky things like Jeremy Keith does on HTML5 for designers and make the title element visible. Um, but that doesn't apply from both sides. So in this case, it's how long, what content do we need to download, how long does it take to process it, is what determines how quickly we begin to show something useful to our visitor. Um, and then it's prioritize what's the most important content. It's the shopping site. What's the most important thing? The product that's not there. Um, and you'd be surprised how often this happens. We've got some information on, we know we're on the right page. It's got a name. We can tell that people like it. It's got five star reviews. We can see its price. We can see it's got 20% off twice, not once, but twice. But the most important thing's not there. And why does the image take so long to load? Because it's lazy loaded. Probably the single most important thing on the page is delayed. And delaying, lazy loading images has its place. It's really good for images that the visitor is not going to see immediately. For stuff that you want your visitor to see, put it on screen. Did it for another client where, you know, because all these lazy loading routines, apart from Chrome now supports uh, the loading attribute on images, um, rely on JavaScript to execute. And for a client who was lazy loading all their images, we took the top three images and just put them in the page as normal markup. And hey presto, People stayed. People bought more. Um, make it easy for people. And then we finally get to the end of the waterfall, and we have third parties executing and sending our personal data to who knows where. Uh, we have things like X number of people are looking at this, X number of people are buying it, trying to create scarcity. And yeah, what's the impact of these third parties? What are they doing to our, people, our visitors' experience? Are they making it better or are they making it worse? And think about pages they load. Think about this as the experience. But while you're thinking about that, remember that everybody's experience of your site will be different. We may build and deliver largely the same content to people, but we are all individuals. We have different devices, we use different browsers, we have different qualities of network. These are the things that sites, builders, designers, operators, we can't change. I consider them constraints we need to design in not just the visual design, but in the engineering design. Um, they're constraints we need to design for. Um, and one of the reasons we need to really think about them is increasingly we're living in a mobile-only world. Um, this is Comscore, who are an advertising network, if I remember correctly. correctly. Um, and once a quarter, they produce a free report. You can go and download it and tells you what people do, do on the web, on the major properties in the UK, and what devices they do it on. And if you follow them over time, you'll find more and more people are going mobile only. You'll see that uh, women are more, slightly more likely to be mobile only than men. Um, but across all age groups, the number of people who just do things on their phone is increasing. Um, it's not just separated by gender and age groups. 
Economic reasons play a huge factor as to why people do things on a phone. Um, socioeconomic groups A and B are about 20% of the UK population. Um, so once we get to the remaining 80% of the UK population, more and more people do things on a phone. They no longer have tablets or laptops or large screen devices. They're doing it on their phone at home. And some of that's because overall we're moving to um, mobile only, but some of that is for economic reasons. Um, but that trend, you know, it's not just people on low incomes. It's, yeah, you can definitely see the way it spreads up. But even people on high incomes, although probably the 17% of people on high incomes have those massive thousand pound iOS phones. Um, but, it, but the range of devices makes everybody's experience really, really different. And the biggest challenge I see as we move to more and more of a mobile only world is we're all busy designing desktop sites, not all, majority, designing desktop sites and shrinking them to fit mobile devices rather than designing mobile experiences and growing them out. And it's not surprising, because this is what we sit in front of all day. We sit in front of big monitors. Um, uh, one fashion, the men's and women's wear fashion retailer I work with, their creative director had a massive screen on her desk, and she wanted to fill every pixel. Unfortunately, it didn't shrink down to the 60 to 70% of her customers who were only seeing her content on mobile. And it's not really working well. I tweeted this out the day before yesterday. Uh, three sites, I could have picked many more. But would anybody buy, like to buy a navy, shining, uh, shimmer, diamante bag? Or a tent? Or even a light? Doesn't this light look marvelous? And these issues are everywhere when we look. And they're because we're busy doing things on desktop rather than thinking about what our customers use. And it feeds into site performance. Um, as I was browsing John Lewis, uh, I was looking at the ceiling lighting page. And it's a long page in terms of it requests 157 products. Um, it's nearly 19,000 pixels long, uh, 22 times the size of the screen. Uh, so it's no wonder it's slow. And this approach we've got of taking desktop and shrinking it down has consequences. It has worrying consequences for the success of our site. You talk to any retailer and they'll tell you that mobile converts at a lower rate than desktop. Um, and one of the reasons I would hypothesize about that is because people engage more with fast experiences. If we look here, these were measured from real visitors to a real site. And we've got how many pages in their session they viewed along there and how long their, the average page load time across their session took. And you can see that people who have fast sessions do a lot of things. And then, apart from the odd few down here, the slower it is, the less people do. Um, and this means when we look at our site, when people say, oh, nobody buys on Android. They don't ever buy on iOS. It's because our analytics are implicitly skewed. They're skewed, if we go back here, there's far more people who have fast experiences than people who have, sl whoop, than people who have slow experiences in our analytics. And we look at sessions or impressions or even sales, they've got far more of the people who had good experiences than had bad experiences. And this leads us to make bad choices. 
Um, your analytics will probably look something like this if you're a retailer, where 50% of the people are on iOS. Um, nobody buys on Android. But and we have this others that's a magic 15%. But you notice this, there's a few desktops in here. There's 8% on Chrome desktop, 4% on Safari desktop, no IE. Um, so our analytics give the indication that all our customers are on Safari, or iOS Safari, because that's the experience we've given them. And believe it or not, iOS, Apple products are a niche product. They may be a big niche. They're bought by people who have money, people like us, or we buy expensive Android phones as well. But in the UK, in three months to June, Android devices outsold iOS devices at a ratio of almost two to one. So we have this mystery that there's more Android in the market, but yet sites show more iOS. And the challenge with this is that Android devices are generally very much slower. Um, they sort of all tracked until we got to the iPhone 6. Um, and then CPU benchmarks or CPU performance just split. You can see that the high-end Samsungs um, still keep up with iOS devices. But if you look at the mid-market, the 170, 180 pound Android phone is much worse performing. And we often don't see this because we are testing or using those high-end devices ourselves. So what I would like to do is encourage you to test on phones you don't see in your analytics. Uh, revolutionary. This is the Amazon um, SIM free page with the most popular SIM free phones. Um, I wouldn't worry about the £14.91. I don't think that's going to render many of your websites. Uh, we get things like the Moto G's, but you know, these are all relatively affordable. But we also have the challenge that 26% of people on, in the UK are on pay-as-you-go phones, or on pay-as-you-go contracts. It used to be around 50%. The introduction of monthly mobile, 30-day mobile phone contracts, and actually the introduction of far more expensive phones drove more people onto contract-based um, things. And so I went looking at the best-selling pay-as-you-go phones, because I thought, why buy a SIM-free phone if you can buy a pay-as-you-go phone? And I was going to buy one of these up here to test with until I realized that it was released in May 2016, and it runs Android 5.1. Um, yeah, it's shocking, actually, that somebody sells this, to be honest, still. Um, so don't buy this phone. Instead, buy this phone. It is a £35 Android phone um, on pay-as-you-go from Tesco's mobile. It is the third most popular one from, on Vodafone. Um, Vodafone are great, and you can actually sort the phones on their site by popularity. Nobody else does this. They tell you relevance or price or reviews, but Vodafone let you sort by popularity. So you can get this 35 pound phone. And believe it or not, it's slow. Um, it's a bit worse than the iPhone 6S I use as a daily driver. But I paid 300 quid two years ago, second hand for my iPhone 6S. Um, is it 10 times worse? than a 500 pound iPhone 7, I think they go for now? No. 
It's, it's a remarkably good phone for the money, but it will sort out the crap sites from the good sites very, very quickly. It will, you will get to the point where you start using it, where you remote debug it, and you go through that waterfall process, you will discover the bits you need to fix. And its performance is actually slower than a Moto G4 on single core and uh, slightly slower on um, multi-core as well. So, yeah, buy a 35 pound phone, you know. You could take your partner out for a romantic dinner or you could buy a phone. <laughs> I'll leave you to decide which. And guess what happens? I know I haven't told you much about how to make sites faster, but there's lots of stuff out there about that. What I want to say is, guess what happens when we invest in making those people with slow experiences have better experiences? Uh, this is real. This is from a woman's wear fashion retailer um, that we worked with a couple of years ago. And what we have is those same sort of charts that show average pages per session up here, how long the session load time was over here. Uh, this is a nice chart for iOS. The blue line is um, Android. And in April 2007, Android was vastly slower. 50% uh, of people had an experience that was slower than this. They were patient people. <laughs> and we did some work with them. Just one microphone falls off. Um, and in June, we made some slight improvements. And we can see that Android has got a little bit faster, two seconds faster, and the curve sort of changed. Um, then we made some more changes. And this is June, and that's August. And if I go back. This bump here was worth several million pounds a year in sales just by doing small incremental improvements that benefited people who had cheaper, slower devices. So there's value in there. And then by the end of our year's work, we'd completely changed the Android experience. The Android experience was almost as fast as the iOS experience even though the design devices were extremely low powered in comparison. So to wrap up, what I'd like you to take away is how successful your site is, how well your site meets your business needs, your visitors' needs, whether they are um, consumers buying stuff from you, whether they are people who want to read your news, whether they're people who want advice or n need advice on medical issues or legal issues or everything else, how effectively you reach them depends on the experience you give them. So to get visitors to have the most value out of your site, we need to deliver them good experiences. And that experience influences how they behave. And their experience is constrained by how we build, how we deliver our pages. They will always have whatever device they've chosen to buy, whatever device they can afford. It's up to us to make their experience work for them. Thank you.